This is Michael McLean from Duke University, and today we're going to be talking about some of the less common tick-borne diseases that you can acquire here in the United States. Our learning objectives for today are going to be to learn the general geographic range, clinical presentations, and some treatment options for these various diseases. The first disease we'll talk about today will be babesiosis. In the United States, babesiosis is most commonly caused by Babesia microti, although some cases are caused by B. duncani or B. divergens as well. Babesia is an intraerythrocytic parasite, which is generally transmitted by exodes ticks similar to Lyme disease. Babesia is most common in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, as you can see pictured here, although some cases are reported on the West Coast as well. It tends to follow the range of the tick vector, as do most of these other tick-borne diseases. Uh, babesiosis is unique because um, it can rarely cause a chronic process, which leads to it being one of the diseases that has also been transmitted by blood transfusions. And this fact often comes up in uh, a lot of the board type questions we see about Babesia, is that it can be and has been known to be transmitted by uh, blood transfusion. Generally, Babesiosis causes a fairly self-limiting febrile illness with myalgias, and commonly, you also see a hemolytic anemia. Remember, it's also an intraerythrocytic parasite, so there is red cell destruction associated with the disease process, and you can pick that up on routine CBC testing. Rarely, however, it can also cause severe multi-organ disease, which can be deadly, although this most commonly occurs in individuals with depressed immune systems or those who uh, have lost their spleens for some reason. The diagnosis of babesiosis is classically made by examination of a peripheral blood smear, similar to the way we diagnose a similar parasitic infection like malaria. Often the smear will contain a pathognomonic Maltese cross appearance of the parasite in the red blood cells, which is quite specific for this disease process, and you can see this demonstrated here in the image to the lower right of the slide. Serologic assays are also available, but are less informative in terms of the timing and burden of infection. There are also PCR assays that are available at some institutions, and these can be a reasonable alternative when your suspicion is very high despite having a negative blood smear, or if your local uh, operators of examination of the blood smear are perhaps not well trained at performing microscopic analysis. The treatment of Babesia is quite different from any of the other tick-borne diseases we talk about, since it's a parasite rather than a bacterium, and therefore it's generally treated with regimens including drugs we typically think of as anti-malarials. Uh, the most well-studied regimens are going to be atovaquone plus azithromycin for mild disease and clindamycin plus quinine for more severe disease. Treatment failure can rarely occur. Uh, it's most commonly seen in individuals who have lost their spleens, and sometimes this uh, distinction also shows up on board exams as well, that asplenic patients are more likely to have a recurrence of disease following appropriate therapy. The next disease we'll talk about will be tick-borne relapsing fever, which is caused by infection with an organism called Borrelia hermsii. Uh, Borrelia hermsii is carried by soft ticks of the Ornithodoros genus, which are remarkable because they're often only attached for just a few hours and can transmit disease in that short time frame, as opposed to many of the other tick-borne diseases where really significant levels of risk transmission don't begin until after the tick has been attached for over 24 hours. So this is a much more rapid transition event and is commonly reported to occur uh, unnoticed or overnight when individuals are asleep, and so they never notice that the tick bite was present. TBRF occurs mostly in western mountain states, as you can see uh, demonstrated here. And on board type questions is often um, hinted at by reference to a patient who stayed in a mountain cabin, uh, perhaps with rodent exposure. As the name implies, TBRF involves recurrent episodes of very high fevers and myalgias, often as high as 103 to 104 degrees. And these are interspersed with periods of general wellness, as depicted in the graphic in the lower right of this slide. The disease most commonly diagnosed by examination of a peripheral smear during a febrile episode, where you can actually visualize the spirochetes uh, on the smear, as you see uh, in the upper right portion of this slide. Serology is also available, but it's most commonly used more for a confirmation of disease, as detection of spirochetes in the blood in the right geographical and clinical scenario is usually sufficient for diagnosis. Similar to many of our other tick-borne diseases, TBRF is susceptible to fairly short courses of doxycycline and is fairly easy to treat um, when the clinical suspicion or correct diagnostic test is performed and the disease is correctly identified. Another disease that can be transmitted by ticks here in the United States is Q fever. Q fever is caused by an infection with the bacterium Coxiella burnettii. This infection is most commonly associated with exposure to livestock, such as cattle, sheep, or goats. The route of transmission is 
most usually thought to involve inhalation of dust or other particles that are contaminated with placental or other body fluids. So someone who's been involved in the birth of a farm animal is a common uh, case presentation that one would see on board type exams and they would be potentially exposed. Or in some Southeast Asian nations, uh, they actually take animal placentas and sell them in the markets uh, for consumption, which has been tied to some outbreaks of Q fever in the right geographical locations as well. Less commonly, Q fever can also be transmitted by ticks, which is why it's a part of this lecture. Uh, it's primarily transmitted by the lone star tick, Amblyoma americanum, but it's not really the primary way this disease is transmitted, even though it's very well described to occur. Q fever presents as both an acute and a chronic illness. Acutely, individuals present with high fevers, myalgias, abdominal pain, it frequently presents with a pneumonia-type syndrome from inhalation of those particles, as we talked about. You can also see some hepatitis, and much less commonly, an acute sort of myocarditis-type picture. In chronic disease, Q fever is classically associated with culture-negative endocarditis. That's definitely worth remembering. And less commonly, the infection can cause a chronic osteomyelitis or other form of chronic infection. The diagnosis of Q fever is performed using serology, as are many of our other tick-borne diseases. The organism is unique in that it actually has two different antigenic phases, which are important to remember. In the acute phase of disease, the host typically displays higher levels of antibodies against the phase two antigen, so you have high phase two directed antibodies. While in the chronic form of disease, the host typically produces extremely high levels to the phase one antibody. Those phrases are sort of the opposite of what you might intuitively think, so it's important to remember uh, that the phase two antibodies, when they're higher, represent acute disease, and the phase one antibodies, when their levels are higher, represent chronic disease, since it sort of backers from what you would intuitively think. Similar to many of our other tick-borne diseases, Q fever is susceptible to fairly short courses of doxycycline or fluoroquinolones. Although in cases of chronic infection, like Q fever endocarditis, we typically have to treat for many, many months, and you use both doxycycline as well as a second agent, uh, which is typically Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. The next disease we'll talk about is tularemia. Tularemia is caused by the bacterium Francisella tularensis. It's most commonly associated with exposure to dead or dying rabbits or rodents. So if you see a board type question about a rabbit hunter, then you might want to be thinking about tularemia. It can be acquired from either direct exposure to animal tissues or bodily fluids, or from the bites of a number of different types of insect vectors, including ticks, primarily from the dermocenter and amblyoma genuses. Tularemia is unique in that it has a, a really a variety of clinical presentations, although the hallmark of most of the disease states is going to be lymphadenopathy. Uh, the most common version that we typically see is probably the ulceroglandular form, where there's an ulcer which forms at the site of the bite or contact with the animal, and then the patient develops fevers and regional lymphadenopathy around the area where the exposure occurred. There's also a pure glandular form that's similar, except it doesn't present with a skin ulcer. And then there's the more severe mnemonic form, which involves a pneumonia-type picture with pleuritic chest pain and cough, and which can be uh, particularly life-threatening. Much less commonly, you can see some, a typhoidal form where there's not any real lymphadenopathy at all, but that's very unusual. And then very, very rarely, there's an oculoglandular or oropharyngeal presentation that can sometimes be seen. The classic treatment of tularemia is streptomycin, which is worth remembering because you're really not going to talk about this drug for very many clinical diseases, and you're not going to see it mentioned very often. Uh, but it still remains uh, the sort of foundation of our therapy for tularemia, especially when the disease is severe. In some individuals with very, very mild disease, however, um, if you're going to treat them on an outpatient basis, then oral doxycycline or fluoroquinolones are probably acceptable alternatives as long as the disease is really mild. But the thing you really want to remember is going to be streptomycin. Another disease that you'll hear a lot about is called STARI, or Masters disease, named after Edwin Masters, who first uh, reported this disease to his local public health department. STARI stands for Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. It occurs primarily in areas of the South Central and Southeast United States, areas which are not typically endemic for Lyme disease. But given the range of the Lone Star Tick, there's now some overlap with STARI also being present in the North and Northeast where Lyme disease can also be found, which can make it confusing sometimes when you see this rash to tell those two diseases apart. STARI is primarily transmitted by Amblyoma americanum, the Lone Star Tick, but the exact etiologic microbial agent remains unknown. There was at one time a suggestion in the literature that an organism called Borrelia lone starii was responsible, but those data have not been uh, found to be reproducible. So for now, the cause really remains a mystery.
Starry presents with an erythema migrans like rash, which is very similar to that we see in acute Lyme disease, and in fact is clinically indistinguishable from the EM rash of Lyme. You can also have a nonspecific febrile illness with general malaise, but we haven't found any Borrelia burgdorferi organisms in Starry lesions. And we also don't see any of the typical disseminated or late findings like arthritis that are more common in Lyme disease. However, given this similarity to acute Lyme, erythema migraines type rashes, especially in Lyme endemic areas, uh, where again, they can be impossible to differentiate from one another, uh, we currently recommend that suspected starry lesions are treated with regimens similar to those that you would use to treat the acute Lyme EM rash, such as short courses of doxycycline or amoxicillin. One of the things we find is that we're constantly discovering new infectious agents, uh, especially in terms of rickettsial or tick-borne diseases. And one of the newer ones that's been described is mentioned here. It's Borrelia myomatoi. It's another spirochete, which is also carried by exodes ticks, similar to Lyme disease. And therefore, it shares the range of Lyme disease in terms of geography. It causes an acute febrile illness with headaches, myalgias, and arthralgias, similar to Lyme. But there's no erythema migraines type rash really described with this disease. And no true long-term findings or sequelae like we see in Lyme disease. So in the setting of suspected Borrelia myomatoi infection, we treat them similar to we would in an acute case of Lyme disease uh, with uh, doxycycline. One of the issues that often comes up in terms of tick-borne diseases is the question of Bartonella infections. So I'll mention that briefly here. Uh, Bartonella species are the etiologic agents of cat scratch disease, trench fever, and rarely culture-negative endocarditis as well. They're thought to be most commonly transmitted by direct exposure to bacteremic animals, such as cats, or by the bites of infected fleas or lice that have fed on those animals. So while Bartonella organisms have been identified in ticks, and we've definitely done this, there's been no convincing evidence that the ticks are actually capable of transmitting the disease. So this is actually not currently thought to represent a tick-borne infection, but this is incorrectly noted in the uh, sort of pop culture and media often enough that I think it's worth mentioning. So we don't think of Bartonella as a tick-borne uh, disease at this point in time, but worth mentioning. In addition to all the other organisms we've mentioned before, there are also a number of viruses which can be acquired from tick bites in the United States uh, that are worth mentioning here. Probably the most common of these is the Colorado tick fever virus. This is a culti virus transmitted by Dermacinter andersonii. Colorado tick fever occurs primarily in the mountain states of the West, as you see listed here, and typically causes an encephalitis type picture with an inflammatory cerebrospinal fluid, petechial rash, leukopenia, and this disease can be fairly severe. The next one we'll mention on the list is Powassan virus. It's a flavivirus similar to dengue or West Nile. Powassan is carried by both Ixodes and Dermacenter ticks and is most common in the northeastern United States and upper Midwestern states, similar to the geographic range of Lyme disease. It also causes an encephalitis type picture and can also be quite severe. In fact, a fair proportion of individuals who contract Powassan virus will have long-term neurologic sequelae from the disease, which can be quite devastating. So this causes a really severe encephalitis, um, and sometimes the damage can be permanent. The last virus we'll mention here is another fairly newly discovered one called the Heartland virus. It's a newly discovered flebovirus transmitted by Amblyoma americanum and was initially described as the cause of a febrile illness with fatigue, diarrhea, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, in a number of cases in Missouri and Tennessee. Most individuals recovered uh, fairly uneventfully. However, there have been a couple of deaths reported. So it's another one to keep our eyes on um, as we move forward in time uh, and try and uh, keep up with all the new diseases as they arise. This may be one that we're seeing more of uh, in the future. So as you can see, uh, our knowledge of tick-borne diseases is continually evolving. And the organisms themselves, their tick vectors are continually evolving, as well as their natural reservoirs in the environment and the way that we interact with the natural reservoirs and ticks is also continuously changing. So this really is an evolving area of research and medicine where we're constantly learning new things. So thank you for your time.